Project planning, scheduling problems. So when we've got a project, we've usually got um, the activity table, something that has to be done before something else can start. So we've got to finish activity A before activity C can start. And normally in project planning, one of the really critical things is the time schedule. So it's important to know how long individual activities are going to take, but also the overall um, time that it's going to take at a minimum to complete the project. Now obviously we're doing really simple examples, but this is um, a massive part of project management. Whether that's a formal job title or just an informal needing and understanding of how activities flow on one from the other to get stuff done in your daily life. So this is a precedence table, but we've added in a waiting. So the estimated time to completion in days of each of our activities. And when we put those weights along the activity network, you'll see I've done it in the larger one down the bottom, but Activity A and B don't have any immediate predecessors, so I'll just go through popping these into our activity network. We've done this, but it's good just to see it over and over again. So activity A, we're going to start with activity A and B because they have no immediate predecessors, and you, then you put a comma and they're waiting. So we've got to label our edges or our arcs with both the activity and it's time. Now it could be time, sometimes it'd be cost, but usually we're looking at time here um, because this will let us find minimum time to completion and the time is related to the cost anyway. So time is usually more useful for us. Now C required A, so we've got C1, D required B and D's cost is 2, E required C and F required C and D so we can tell that F is going to be here. E will be there and we'll have to use a dummy because C occurs in these two but it's not just the same. So the cost of F was 1, the cost of E was 3 and since F needs C we've got a dummy going in And the cost of a dummy is always zero because C has already had been done. Um, we're just getting C linked down to here. Um, so G required E and F, so that's why they both feed into here. G is a predecessor for H, so we've got G, 2, and H one to the finish. All right, now what we need to look at is something called float time or slack. Float time or slack time. If we just have a look at this little bit here, from the start to the finish, there's two different paths that both have to happen before we can get to activity G and hence to the finish. To get A, C and E done will be 9, 10, 11, 12 hours. That's the minimum time to get those done. To get B, D and F done will be 6, 7, 8, 9 hours. So there's a three hour float time on this path here or slack time. What that means, especially if you look at your uh, textbook, is this is a, a much shorter, smaller example. Here we've got to do A then B and that'll be eight hours and C can happen separately because it doesn't require A or B and it's only six hours. We can st we're going to need these five hours for A we're going to need those three hours for B, so the earliest the whole thing can finish is eight hours. We could start C at the same time as A, and then we'd have two spare hours or float time or slack time at the end. We could delay C by an hour and have an hour spare at the end. We could delay C by two hours and they finish at the same time. 
So we do spend a lot of time looking at where this float time is and what's the earliest and latest we can start something. So float time or slack time flexibility about when we need to start an activity. Um, so the slack time or the float time that we've got on starting activity B here is three hours because we could delay it by three hours because this path takes three hours more than this path. We wouldn't delay it any more than that. Now critical path analysis is usually at this stage looking for the minimum completion time for the whole project and we really want to be identifying activities that have no float time and that if we delay those activities there'll be a delay to the completion of the entire project this path has three hours float time this has no float time so if there's a delay in here Starting this will be pushed out and so finishing the project will be pushed out and the critical path is the activities that are critical to completing the project in the shortest time. So the critical path is A, C, E, G, H because that's the one where there's no float time and it's critical to get those all done in their time to completion, otherwise our project will be delayed. Now I'll do two videos on this because you can see we're already up to seven minutes, which is pretty terrible. And critical path analysis is looking for information about individual activities. EST is our earliest starting time and our latest finishing time is LFT. And I should write that down somewhere but it didn't give us enough space. Um, I'll go through one example. This is really just reading or learning what all this is so we can read this critical path stuff and then I'll do a proper example for our next one. So I won't ask you to make one of these this lesson, but we've got to understand it. So this is our activity network and each vertex has two boxes or a box split into two cells and it's yellow and blue and it's like that in your textbook as well just to help us work it out. And what we're about to do is called forward scanning. The yellow box on any vertex has the earliest starting time that can possibly happen and forward scanning is when we go forward and do the earliest starting time for every activity. So we start at zero. So the earliest we can start activity A and B is at zero hours. And then we forward scan adding the activity time into the, the, the earliest we can start into each one. So the earliest I can start activity C is when I've finished activity A and that's at eight hours in. And I need an hour then to do C. So the earliest I can start E is at one more hour which is nine hours in. Now I'm stopping there for a second because it starts to get confusing. Let's have a look at B. The earliest I can, st I, can I, I do B and it takes me six hours. So the earliest starting time for D is at six hours in. Now, the thing we get to here, 
the um, dummy and E can both start at nine hours in. If I scan forward here, B and D, six plus two is eight, I won't put eight here because F can't start until C has finished and the earliest that that dummy can start to get down to here to get us to F is 9. So you always put, when you're forward scanning, if you've got two paths coming in, the larger of the time values. Because obviously, if I've got to get C finished, I've needed 9 hours, not just this 8. Then, I need both E and F to be completed to start G. So I've got to again put the largest of the numbers. 9 plus 3, I can start based on this path at 12. Whereas 9 plus 1, I could start based on that path at 10 hours. But no, I need them both to be done. So the earliest I can start G is at 12 hours in. Then it's straightforward. I need earliest for uh, H is 14. 1 for H here, so the earliest I can finish this project, oh, it's not hours, it's days, my bad, I'm sorry, <gasps> it's days, is 15 days. So the minimum completion time, 15 days for this project. Now, to find out some more information, we do backwards scanning in the blue box. And the right hand cell, the blue box, contains the latest finishing time, LFT, for any activity that ends at this vertex. And we start with 15, because the latest finishing time, really, ideally, would be 15 for this. For each activity, we take the latest finishing time, and we subtract the duration of our activity, and we write our answer in. So obviously, the latest we can finish G is at 14 hours. The latest we can finish E and F is 12. Now, these ones here didn't have any slack time. You'll expect that these numbers are going to be the same in each box because the latest I can finish E, 12 minus 3, is 9. The latest I can finish uh, A is... Sorry, so the latest I can finish C is 9. The latest I can finish... So finish A, you see like we're getting to the end of A here, is 9 minus 1, which is 8. And this sits at zero here. So see, these numbers end up the same. But look what happens here. 12 in the blue box, take away 1. The latest I can finish D is 12 minus 1, 11 hours in. That's because it's going to take me 12 hours to get to here this way. So that float time says I could wait and finish D at 11. I'd finish F at 12 days in. Sorry about the days and hours messing up again. So there's some slack time here when these numbers are different. Tracking back, 11 take away two hours to do D. The latest I can finish B is at nine hours in. So the earliest I can start D is at six hours in. The latest I can finish B is at nine hours in. And when we've done our forward and backward scanning, our float time, so for activity D, float time is three hours, three days. Oh my God, I'm sorry. When we're identifying the critical path, that is, the path, the activities that are critical to completing this in minimum time, we're choosing the activities where there's no difference 
in earliest start time and latest finish time. And we can highlight our critical path here. I'll choose a lovely purple. This is our critical path because these are the activities where our earliest start time and latest finish time are the same and so there's no float time. I'll do another example tomorrow. This is so that we know what this looks like and can read a critical path diagram.